in your last five mayors have all been African-American. And the question is, well, why don't they do more for their own people? And the reason is, you're not electing a black person mayor. You're electing a person mayor who's part of the status quo. And if you don't challenge that status quo, then things don't change. Right. And I may be the first person in local politics to point this out. Who, who was the, uh, the last non-African-American to, to even be a forerunner? To, to challenge the Susan Weiner and didn't pull it off. She's one and done, and then they ran her out of town. Oh, really? Gone. Did she come close? Well, Susan, Susan was the person who finally came along and said, you know, John Rusikas could be mayor for the rest of his life. He'll die being mayor. He'll wind up being mayor 50 years. And it was because of Johnny Rusikas that they finally got around to imposing term limits on mayors. And then Susan Warner came along and said, you see, the longer you stay in office, the less you do to serve others and the more you do to serve yourself. Mm -hmm. And things become stagnant. But the problem is the longer someone stays in office, the harder it is to get them out. And that's why I want term limits for aldermen. Right now, aldermen do not have term limits. And there are some people in this town that are considered to be invincible. No one... No one will seriously run against Van Johnson or Tony Thomas because they think that these people cannot be beat. So they don't even want to run. And that means that those people could literally stay in their jobs forever. Wow. And the longer they stay there, the harder it is to, to move them. Yeah, there we go. So that's, that's the big issue here. We're talking about status quo. And when, you know, you, you ever hear everybody talks about change, you know, change, change, it's time to change, change. Change. Rule join around on change. Change. It's time for change. People want change. Well, you know, people do want change, but you know why seven out of ten voters stay home now? Because they realize that it doesn't matter who the hell you elect, nothing ever changes. Nothing changes. Why? Because on the day you take office, that's when the people who really run this town, they come into the office, they close it on and say, Hi, I'm Steve Green. Let me tell you what time it is. Hi, I'm Dave Simons. Guess what time it is? And that's who runs the town. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Do you, you want to know why nothing ever changed? Look at who contributes to the campaigns. You'll see the same names behind every winner. So what you have is, no matter who's the mayor, they're a messenger boy for the real power in the town. Yeah. And that's why nothing ever changes. And these people, these people, they're not elected. And most people don't know who the hell they are. So that's what time it is in Savannah, Georgia. You, you keep electing, oh, change. Oh, we, oh, we have a black woman now. Oh, things are going to change. Well, really? Well, the black woman that you elected mayor had already been on council for three terms. She was baked in. She's old school. You know, uh, Edna Jackson has uh, lunch at the club, at the exchange club. Yeah. Yeah. Edna Jackson drives home in a, Escalade her house on Wilmington Island at night. She's got, she's got a Gus Devon in her rearview mirror. She don't hear gunshots at night when she goes to sleep. Yeah. Edna Jackson, she's baked in, man. She's old school mainstream. Doesn't matter her sex or her color. Bottom line is she's status quo. Hmm. She's status quo. So what I'm hoping is that African American Savannah has finally come to the realization that just because you elect a black mayor doesn't mean that things are going to get better for African American Savannah overnight. Yeah. So the thing is, until you elect someone who will challenge the status quo and say, look, look, uh, there's facts and then there's the truth. The facts are you run the town, but the truth is you run it into the ground. Mm -hmm. And if we don't fix this stuff now, we are, we are one incident away from heaven, a Baltimore or a Ferguson. We're one incident away. We're, in fact, we're living on borrowed time. Now, why do I say that? Because your police department is in disarray. Now, they're trying valiantly to put it back together, but I got news for you. You haven't heard the worst of it yet. There's a federal investigation that's not quite done, and when it is, you're going to lose six or seven other high ranking officers. You ain't heard the rest of this yet. Allow me to break the bad news to you. It ain't over yet. And you haven't even begun to hear the sad story of Andre Oliver, 
who was in internal affairs and committed suicide on the morning that he was supposed to talk to the FBI. It was the same week that Willie Lovett went down. You never heard that story. And until Savannah hears it, then we're not done. When are we going to hear that story? You know, all things being even, you're going to have to wait for... Well, you know, that was actually tough, touched off when McCormick was canned. You remember that officer? Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Well, on the way out the door, McCormick sang like a bird, but said a lot of stuff that never made it to the paper. And so um, you've got to put the pieces together in a town where you're not getting the news from the newspaper. We have one small newspaper in Savannah, Georgia, and it doesn't publish the news. I'll leave it to you to wonder why. If the newspaper did a better job, I'd win this election in a landslide. Why is that? Because the people are, are poorly informed, and a poorly informed voter is, the, is a bad voter. Mm -hmm. And I will also remind you that in the last mayoral election, seven out of ten people stayed the hell home. They didn't vote. So if seven out of ten are disenfranchised, the great silent majority, and the other three that are going to the polls are poorly informed, the system is broken, sir and cannot be fixed by the current administration. You either hire an outsider to come in here and push the reset button and sweep it clean, or it, it is going to continue as it is and it's not going to improve. It's not gonna improve by itself. I hope you like Savannah exactly the way it is because it's never gonna get any better than this. Do you uh, feel that? So do you feel like you can make that change? Yes, sir. I think one person can make a, a huge difference. What would you do? What would be your first steps? You are obligated, when you're the mayor of any town on this planet, to ensure that public safety is job number one. Protect and serve is the motto of every city on the planet. Protect and serve. You are charged with providing law enforcement. So the job starts with law enforcement, and it ends with law enforcement, because every other issue that we can talk about today we'll get back to law enforcement. You want to talk about crime? It goes back to law enforcement. You want to talk about poverty? Back to you want to talk about tourism and the state of tourism in Savannah, Georgia? It goes back to how safe the town is. Because at such point in time, tourists say, no, it's not safe in Savannah, then they won't come back here. So everything, everything hinges on job one. Job one is public safety. Now, it is my opinion that if you want to fix a police department that's been broken and ravaged as ours has been, then you give the cops what they want to do their job. You don't tell them what you're going to give them. You ask them what they need and you give it to them. Sure, higher salaries, great. That's great, but that's not everything. They need training, they need equipment. You realize that our police department, our headquarters, has been in the same building since 1860? Yeah, we make our cops go to work in a building that is outdated, it's a sick building, and the people work in it get sick. It is a national disgrace that we force them to stay in that police department. And yet, if you look at the current list of uh, construction projects, they keep pushing that police station further and further and further down the line. It ought to be priority number one. We shouldn't be talking about stadiums and cultural arts centers and arenas. We should be talking about police headquarters. So, you give the cops what they want. Now, i tell you something else, and it's a point of contention, and it's, it's a sticky one at that. You ask most police officers, they'll tell you that the problem with them starts at the very top, and I don't mean the chief, I mean the city manager. The city manager oversees the police department. The chief reports to the city manager. The chief directly reports to the city manager. The city manager has no experience in law enforcement, doesn't speak the language, out of her depth. You ask any cop and they'll tell you, you know, all things being even, we'd like to have a city manager who knows about law enforcement. Now, when Stephanie Cutter came on board and uh, it was in uh, the, the Lovett affair was brewing, Stephanie Cutter had to resort to hiring an outside agency to come to town to tell her what she needed to know and what she should have known and in some cases knew and did nothing about. And it cost the taxpayer hundreds of thousands of dollars, took a full year. And when the report was, was delivered, put on a desk, there was still a lot of issues that have never been dealt with. So that being said, law enforcement tells me they want a new and different city manager. 
So my promise to the people of Savannah is day one of my new administration is we find the best and brightest talent on this planet to manage the city of Savannah because that is the most powerful position. I want the best and brightest, not the blackest or the whitest. I don't care who, I don't care what color they are. Not to argue, not to pick fights with, with my old friend, Dr. Otis Johnson. I don't care what color the person is, what sex they are. I want the best talent that I can find to be the most powerful person in the city. And I think that we should have the first open, honest, transparent search for that talent because we didn't have it with Stephanie Cutter and we didn't have it with Rochelle Small Tony. They were railroaded into office. And I think that Savannah deserves to have an open, honest, national search for the best talent we can find to be city manager. I don't have any personal acts to grind with Stephanie Cutter. Stephanie Cutter is a person that has exceptional integrity. You ask anybody who works with Stephanie Cutter, they'll tell you. Stephanie Cutter, incredible integrity. The problem, they will tell you, is that she has 22 people reporting to her directly. 22 direct reports. And many of the people that head these departments are incompetent, and they should be removed, and they remain. They remain to the city's detriment and to Stephanie's uh, performance. And if Stephanie doesn't want to remove them, then we have to remove Stephanie and find somebody who will. So we have to start at the top with some of our problems because it does trickle down. And then once you get to the bottom, you go right back up to the top again. So the buck stops, it begins and ends with the city manager. And the police, past and present, tell me that one of the things they think is crucial is that they have a city manager that understands law enforcement because the city manager is not giving the police department what they need. I'll tell you something. Now. Let's be specific because people are going to ask. Right now, the city of Savannah is using an old antiquated ratio of police officers per thousand people in this city. Okay. Right now, the city of Savannah, Georgia, employs less than three officers per 1,000 people. The mayor and city council have just spent a couple hundred thousand dollars to go to New York City for three days to find out from the experts in New York how they reduce crime. I could have saved them the trip and the money because I can tell you in two minutes how they do it. They hire a lot of cops. There's more than 50,000 law enforcement people working in New York City, and they've got five cops per thousand in New York, we got less than three. Do the math, as they say. The point is, we are, we are using a ratio, we are using a ratio that does not include the more than 33,000 commuters and visitors to Savannah, Georgia on a daily basis. It does not include the 9,000 SCAD students and so consequently, each of those people has to be factored in to make sure that you've got enough law enforcement to, to protect and serve. Right now, the city of Savannah will tell you that they are about 70, 75 people short. I, I think that it's closer to 140. So when you ask the police what they want, they want more policemen. However, they've just been granted a new pay raise and the city had to look under sofa cushions to find the money. The city will tell you, well, we don't have the budget. We don't have the budget to hire all of these new officers. We don't have the money. Which brings up another issue. This is a town where hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars is misspent. It's thrown away. It's thrown in the street. There's no, transpens no transparency. There's no accountability. There's money. There's money to pay the police. There's plenty of money. There's an ocean of money. But right now it's being squandered. So... That leads to other issues. Some people say to me, well, where's, this, where's all this money you're talking about? Well, let's take a look at another closely allied issue, the issue of a city attorney. We have a part-time city attorney who rarely goes to court for the city. He's more of a traffic manager. He doles out cases to other law firms to handle because in many cases he's barred from handling it. Conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. Because when Edna Jackson started her new legal department and hired Brooke Stilwell, a senior partner at the biggest law firm in town, on the first day of uh, office, Brooke said, um, well, I have to recuse myself from the biggest case going on right now, which is 
the parking deck at L Square. He said, I have to recuse myself because my firm is already involved with other firms are involved. And so on day one, your city attorney said, well, I can't do the job that you've hired me to do. I got to farm it out. We lose a fortune in the process, including bond fees. I would say to you that you could save an absolute fortune if you had a full-time city attorney, independent, clear, beholden to no one. You have a full-time city attorney and, and the difference is going to be ginormous when it comes to how much money this, this town spends. You know, it was an embarrassing moment when city council asked the city attorney a few weeks ago, how much money have you uh, authorized in legal fees in the three years you've had your office? He said, I don't know. They said, well, find out. He said, well, it's going to take me a little while. He said, no, find out. He said, well, I can tell you how much it, it, it's been this year. They said, no, 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 no. We want to know for all three years. And Brooke Stillwell couldn't tell him. And Tommy Bordeaux, Alderman Bordeaux, had to file a freedom of information request of his own government to find out how much money the city spends in legal, affair, in legal fees. And when they find out, their eyes bugged out because they found out they were paying attorneys who were sitting around doing nothing. So there's an ocean of money out there that is being misspent. What was the number, Murray? A couple hundred thousand dollars in one case. A couple hundred thousand, the, the, the case that made it to the newspaper. I, I forget the attorney's name, but it's easily retrievable because uh, Alderman Bordeaux and this attorney got into a pissing match publicly about it. And um, there were many letters and editorials that were published on the subject about a couple months ago. But in any event, uh, that's just one, one incident in, in an overall scheme that has defrauded the city out of millions and millions of dollars in fees. So there are things that you can fix immediately if someone only will, if someone only will. But as I said to you, this is a town that, as small as it is, it's in the hands of a few people who are not elected. And consequently, the public has no idea when it comes to accountability and transparency. There's no such thing in the city of Savannah right now. There's just simply no such thing. Murray, what do you feel like your strengths are? What, do you, what, what strengths will you use in your toolbox to repair the city? I'm a communicator. I'm a communicator. I have, I have been a professional communicator all of my life. As a writer, an author, a speaker, a professor, I have been a communicator all of my life. I have a law degree. I worked in my father's law firm for a dozen years. And I have sat down at tables with some of the most remarkable minds of my generation, from Nobel laureates to made guys in the mafia, from movie stars to rock and roll stars, to the Dalai Lama and Coretta Scott King. I have been at some very interesting gatherings, very interesting meetings of the mind. There, I feel like there isn't anyone that I can't sit down and talk to, and in five minutes, you and I are going to find a common bond. You and I are going to find a, a point where you and I can proceed together. I don't care what the issue is. Black, white, rich, poor, young or old. I want to be the moderator of that conversation. Because we live in a town now where the races have never been further apart, nor the classes. And they have stopped talking to each other. And so what I find in running for mayor is that everybody is yelling at me and telling me what it is that they want me to know and they want me to repeat it right back to them because they're not able to tell the other side. People have forgotten the art of conversation. They've forgotten the art of discussion. Now all you have is people going online, stating their opinion, expecting you to give them a thumbs up, and if not, to hell with you. Unfriend. I'm done with you. People don't discuss things anymore. They just talk at each other. And if you don't agree with me, I don't want to hear your reasons why, because I'm right. So consequently, communication is broken down. And what am I? I'm a communicator. And I want to be the moderator at that, as mayor of city council, I want to be the moderator that puts eight other people in the room, black, white, men, women, rich, poor, and let's solve the common problems that we have. There's no more communication. 
And I'll tell you something else that, that is disappointing to me. Far too many Savannians have packed up and left Savannah. And many of the loudest voices you hear on social media now come from people who can't even vote because they don't live in the city anymore but still want to tell us how to run the town. They are angry and they're scared and that's a bad combination. How long will it take you to clean up the city, Mike? Clean up is a broad term. I can fix the police department and I can fix it pretty quick. I can fix it pretty quick by giving them what it is that this administration won't give them because the administration can't see the real problem. You do, you do the math, come up with the right numbers, give the police what they want, and they're done. They're fixed. And then we can all breathe a sigh of relief and get on to the other issues, which will not be half as serious as they are now because you can now stand down. You don't have to worry about safety. And believe me, that'll come as a huge relief to tourism in this town. It'll also alleviate the poverty. So it alleviates all of the other issues that we can talk about today. And you can fix the police department. It can be fixed if you only will. And the reasons right now that they give you for not fixing it are bogus reasons. Those aren't the real reasons. They say they ain't got the money, they got the money. Here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. And I don't want to hit this too hard. But you go around the city in a lot of communities and you ask them what they want, you know what they'll tell you? We want to be left alone. We don't want to see cops on every corner. We don't want to live in a police state. No, we don't want a precinct in our neighborhood. We don't want to live like that. So you got to be careful. You got to be careful about what you want for the city because there's a lot of people in the city that don't want it. There's a lot of people in the city that don't want to see a cop on every corner. They don't want to see a precinct on every neighborhood. They don't want it. So you got to be careful. After all, I am running for an office where I'm going to be hired by these same people. And a lot of them say, no, 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 listen, man. We don't want to live in a police state. These ideas you have about fixing the police department, no, they would prefer to live in a world where police aren't necessary at all. And there are, <laughs> there are a few places on this planet where there are no police forces. People say, well, why can't we live like that in that utopia? Well, there's reasons. But the point is, as you go throughout this tent, there's a lot of people say, no, 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 no. These, your, your platform, and I, from, from day one, from your first, your first, public safety? No, 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 no. That's not the most important problem. I don't even want to talk about that. So until we can agree on that, sir, we have a fundamental problem. How do you feel about gun control? I don't own one, but my house has been burglarized twice. And uh, my wife no longer feels safe in living where we are. I can't sell the house. I do hear gunshots at night from where I live. I live in Midtown, and it concerns me. As far as controlling guns, you know, I believe that people have the right to own them. And all I can say is that in this town, I'd turn to law enforcement and say, what do you say? What do you say? What do you need? What kind of help do you need? They'll tell you, the police will tell you they need bigger guns and better guns. And I think that mirrors the sentiments of a lot of people in the public, that they all think that they need bigger and better guns as well. After we live in a military town, and an awful lot of people own them, I can't tell them that we got to get rid of them. That's not going to be a popular thing to hear. But as far as uh, the proliferation and the access and the availability of it, I don't know how you stop it in a, in a free society where it's a, a fundamental right to bear arms. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you have both. It's not an easy thing to resolve. Personally, I, I, I want to find a way to take them out of the hands of 15-year-olds. I'd rather take a, a gun out of a kid's hand and, and replace it with a football, a basketball, or a baseball bat. Because in my opinion, these youth gangs running around are nothing more than a baseball team looking for a diamond to play on and somebody to supervise them. I mean, when I grew up in Savannah, Georgia in the 60s, I walked two blocks to a ball field, and my daddy was the coach. And Chatham Steele sponsored the team. And we won the city championship in 1964, and it was a proud day for the Silvers. But that's what we did then. Because the daddies, after work, would come and, and, and uh, coach their sons. And we played ball. And we played sports year-round, and we were supervised, and it was a beautiful thing, and it didn't cost a lot of money. But there was a ball field in every neighborhood around this town, Mr. Brooks. And I don't know what the hell happened, but I'd like to see those days come back. And I think that if you go into the west side of town, and you find all these troubled kids around raising hell, and you say, come over here. I got a baseball field over here, and I got a brand new bat, and I got a new uniform. Come on, let's go do this. And see. I guarantee you 
that those youth gangs will turn into baseball teams. I guarantee you, sir. Now, go ask the city about their budget for parks and recreation, and ball fields. Ask them. Ask them what's happened to the youth centers. And ask them what's happened on the neighborhood level. Ask the neighborhoods. Why, why haven't y'all gotten together, all of you righteous citizens who sit there and bang on government about what it's doing and not doing? Why aren't you doing it? Because back in the, I want to remind you, back in the 50s and 60s, all, and my daddy was a lawyer. What my daddy did is he and a few of his friends, they went to the local businesses and say, give us $100 to buy uniforms for these boys. They went to Cranman Insurance. They went to United 5 and 10. They went to Chatham Steel. And they said, give us $100 to put a uniform on these kids' back. And that's how you do it. This isn't rocket science. This is Little League Baseball. And I grew up at a time, I mean, let me tell you something. It was, it was a big deal in Savannah, Georgia. And you can't tell me the kids have changed that much in the last 40, 50 years to where they don't want to play Little League Baseball. And it breaks my heart when you hear about three 15-year-old boys shoot and kill another 15-year-old boy for a cell phone. No, 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 no. These are kids that are not, these are not vicious, you know, animals. These are kids who need a little supervision little love in their lives. That's what they need. That's all we needed. That's all we need. It worked for me. I want to do the stuff that worked for me. You know, one of the reasons I'm running for mayor is that I grew up in a generation where in school they taught us at some point in your life, you got to give back to society. You got to give back to community. You got to give back to your country. Now, you're going to either do that by joining the service for a couple of years well, you've got to find some way to serve the government. You're going to deliver the mail, work in the hospitals and orderly. you got Peace Corps. You're going to do something. You're going to do something to, to pay back to society what society does for you in this country. We were expected to do that. In the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, you didn't have a choice. You had to serve. It was mandatory. I'd love to see those days come back where you've got to put in two years in the Army. Got to. Sure would cut down on the prison population, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Bottom line is, I'm running because that's what it means to be a good citizen. And what, what breaks my heart is I go around, I'm the only one running for mayor. Nobody else wants this job. Nobody wants to run for alderman. Nobody wants to run for anything. Nobody wants to do anything anymore. Seven out of ten people don't even vote. The system is broken. My new slogan is... Uh, when you're down to me, you know you're in trouble. I'm the last man standing. Nobody wants the job. If I don't run against the incumbent, there ain't nobody to run for mayor of Savannah, Georgia. Not that there aren't people who don't want the job or can't do the job, but there's a long list of reasons why they don't run. The process is vicious, number one. And people also feel like the system now, we are so broken in this town that you can't fix it. And people are telling me, you know something? You can't win, and even if you do, you can't fix it. That's how disconnected, they, I mean, they are discouraged to the point of being disconnected, to the point of being disenfranchised, meaning they don't vote. They don't want anything to do with the system because they say the system stinks, it's broken, you can't fix it. And they tell me, you know, when you lose this election, you'll leave too. That's where we are. I'm the last man standing, sir. And when you're down to me, you know you're in trouble. I didn't set out in life to be mayor of Savannah, Georgia. I've done a lot of things in life. It took this whole book to explain where I've been and what I've done. You won't read one page in here that I was elected to a public office. No. But I am of an age now. I'm 62 years old. And I realize that I have done everything in life that I came here to do for me and my family. And I made up my mind a few years ago that I would dedicate the rest of my life to public service. Now, I'm in my prime, but I'm also running out of time. And that is why I seek to serve at the highest level I can find. That's why I'm running for mayor. Because in my opinion, to be mayor of Savannah, Georgia is not an honorary title. It's a service job. And it doesn't pay very well at that. The mayor does not run around Savannah, Georgia with a top hat and a cane and a sash and do a lot of ribbon cuttings. No, it's a service job. You fix things. You repair the things that have been broken. That's what it means to be mayor of Savannah, Georgia at least in my opinion. Tell me about the Silver family. Saints and sinners. Seven generations have lived in Savannah, Georgia. Seven! 
On my mother's side, all German and Russian Jews came here 100 years ago, had 20 cents to their name. When they died, they owned half the town. That was the Eicholzes. Eicholz Realty. Incidentally, I'll show you how small this town is. Dickie Mopper, the prominent realtor who also ran for mayor unsuccessfully, Dickie Mopper's grandmama and my great-grandmother were the same lady. She was the head of Eicholz Realty. I live in a house that she left me in 1962. So that's my mama's clan, the Eicholzes. My father, my father's daddy was uh, the famous proprietor of Bo Peep's Billiards and down on Congress Street. For 40 years, my granddaddy ran a bar and a pool room and a restaurant called Bo Peep's. And he, he, was, he was, in his day, I mean, that was the place. That's where everybody went. That's where everybody hung out. It's a vacant lot now. They tore the building down in the 60s. But for 40 years, my granddaddy, that's what he did. He was a bootlegger when he started out. He was a bookie. He made a million dollars in his day back when it was tough to make a dollar. And uh, my father's mother was uh, a girl from one of the big Irish clans in this town. She was a McCabe and a Mendel. And uh, at one point in time, my family in this town numbered more than 100 close relatives. And now I'm, it's down to me and a cousin. Everybody else is dead or gone because it did not end well for Silvers in Savannah. It did not end well. My granddaddy died by his own hand in 1963. And my daddy was disbarred from the practice of law. And in 1966, he moved us from here to Atlanta by way of Brunswick. He got his license back and he went back doing what he was doing before. And he, he became attorney to Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King and Andrew Young. And that's why he moved us to Atlanta. And uh, I stayed in Atlanta until 1990. I came back home to Savannah briefly, and I didn't stay here six months because the town was in a coma. I couldn't find anything to do. And so I went back to Atlanta. I didn't come back here until 1998, which was right before the storm and the city exploded. And so it took me a long time to get back here, but I'm the last of my clan. Everybody else is dead or gone. Now, when I was 16 years old, I went into business. I was a concert promoter. The year was 1969. It was the year of Woodstock. And I told my daddy, I said, if 200,000 hippies would go sit down in the field for three days in the sun and the rain to listen to this music, I got a feeling they'd pay $3 to come inside where it's nice and cool to listen to the same music. And my daddy was the kind of guy that said to me, look, don't talk about it, do it. Do it! Pick up the phone, call somebody, find out, do it. 16 years old, 1969, I picked up the phone and I called a, a talent agency in New York. And I got, I called, there was a long distance operator back then. You get an operator on the phone. And I said, operator, hook me up with whoever it is that books bands. And said, one minute, please. And they put me through to CAA. And a man picks up the phone and I said, uh, I, well, 16, my, you know, my father and I had the same, I'm a junior. So I pretended to be my father. I said, yes, this is Murray Silver, and I'm, uh, I'm an attorney here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm thinking of promoting concerts. So the guy goes, yeah, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get, no, there's nobody promoting shows in Atlanta, and we think that market is going to be huge, man. Yeah, glad you called. How, what can we do for you? I said, yes, I'd like the Rolling Stones, please. He said, no, 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 man, no. You, the Rolling Stones are, you don't order them like a pizza. You have, to, you have to earn the stones, man. We have to have a relationship with you first. I said, okay, then the, who do you want me to bring? And the man said, okay, now you're talking. Now you're talking. He said, okay, this is what we got. He said, we have a brand new band that just came out of England. They just recorded their first album. They want to come to the United States. They've never been here before. They're called Fleetwood Mac. I said, I've never heard of them. He said, of course you haven't. He said, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to send you the album and some photographs, and you'll listen to them. He said, they're really cool, man. They're big in England. They're going to be big here. And I said, okay. What else do you... He said, then we have another brand new band out of California just recorded their first album. You can have them. And uh, the band is called Grand Funk Railroad. I said, I've never heard of them. He said, of course you haven't, but they're going to be huge. Now, I want to remind you that in 1969... There weren't even any FM radio stations in America. 
there was only A and M top ten, top forty. You couldn't hear this on the radio, and if you couldn't hear it on the radio, you might as well not even exist. The only way people heard this music was you had to know somebody who owned a really uh, hip record store, and you'd go in the record store and there'd be like import albums and so forth, and the guy behind the counter say, "Hey, have you heard about this band in England called Fleetwood Mac? I mean, these guys are cool." And so I was that kid in your class that was cool and knew all the music because everybody else is listening to the Bobby Sherman and Bubblegum on radio. So I told him, the guy said, look, we'll make you a package deal. Both bands, uh, we'll send you a contract. And if you want to do this, you send us half the money in the bands and give us the other half the night of the show. And you're in business, sir. They send me the albums. I'm playing them one afternoon. My father comes home and goes, what the hell is that? What are you, what are you playing? I said, you, you, well, you remember you told me to call those people and about the I said, well, this is what they sent me, Dad. He goes, yeah. He says, you know, that sounds like stuff. That sounds like real stuff. I said, it is, Dad. I said, and I, I, I have this, um, this, this contract here. They, 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 um, <clears throat> we, can, we can bring both bands uh, to, in, uh, in concert, but, um, you know, it's going to be $10,000 for them, and I need $5,000. And my father said, well... That's all the money I have. That's everything I have. You sure we can get our money out of this? Sure you made your money? I said, oh, oh yeah, Dad, oh yeah. I said, all the kids in school will buy tickets to the show. There's 2,000 kids going to my high school. I'm going 2,000 kids times $3, that's $6,000. Yeah, that's a pretty good start. 6000 we can pay for the whole show. You know, just, just the school. And my father, God love him, who realized that I was having a very hard time. I'm now attending my fifth school in 16 years. He'd moved us around a lot, and we paid a horrible price for what happened to my father. After all, nobody liked us. My father was, was a civil rights lawyer in a time and place where nobody did that, and everybody hated us. Well, we, moved, we, we moved a dozen times before I was 17 years old. And my father realized I was having a very hard time. He said, well, okay, let's do this thing. Long story short, December the 7th, 1969, I brought Fleetwood Mac and Grand Funk Railroad to the Oglethorpe Fieldhouse in Atlanta, Georgia, and I lost my ass because nobody had ever heard of them and nobody bought tickets. And I couldn't pay Fleetwood Mac. And Fleetwood Mac said, well, this is our first show and we can't get to our next gig unless you pay us. So we're going to have to come home with you because we can't even pay a hotel bill. And my father had given me all of his money. He said, well, I don't have any more to give you. And you tell me you're going to get the money back. What happened to me next is the subject of this book. It's still, I have one thing left on my bucket list other than being mayor of Savannah, Georgia. I want to make a movie out of that story. Because what happened next you wouldn't believe. So, I promoted concerts. I brought, uh, to Atlanta, I brought... Um, the Grateful Dead and the Almond Brothers together for the first time, 1970, May of 70. I brought John Mayall, Edgar and Johnny Winter. I brought uh, Billy Preston. Smartest move I ever made because Billy Preston later went on to play on the road with the Stones and uh, George Harrison. And that's how I got the gig to be the tour photographer because I picked up the phone and asked Billy to introduce me. So the music business was so small, everybody knew everybody. And so it led, even after I went bust as a concert promoter, I then got a new job as a writer and as a photographer for all the tours by using my connections. And that's what led to, to writing my first book. I wrote the book Great Balls of Fire about Jerry Lee Lewis that came out in 82 and then was made into the movie that starred Dennis Quaid and Winona Ryder and Alec Baldwin in 1989. And so... Um, I did not go back to the practice of law. I stayed with rock and roll and books and movies and TV. And, and to show you how small this world is, it was um, while we were making the movie Great Balls of Fire that I met Richard Gere. And Richard Gere introduced me to the Dalai Lama. And it changed my life again. At that point, I put all of this foolishness aside and I went to work for the Tibetans. And that's what I did for many years. I gave up rock and roll and books and movies to go to work for the Dalai Lama. I used to be the tour manager for the monks that go around the country to colleges and museums and they perform a program of the sacred chants and dances and they make these sand mandala paintings out of colored uh, crushed marble. I was their 
their road manager because none of these boys speak English. They can't drive. And it was just like being on the, band, on the road with a rock band. It's a dozen monks. We're going from college to college in a van. I mean, it's just like being on tour with a band, except there's no sex, no drugs, and no rock and roll. Otherwise, it's exactly like it. Being with a bunch of monks, it's exactly like it. So this is what I did for years. I was the tour manager. And it's the same group who's been to the Jepson and the Telfair many times and still comes a couple of times a year and, and goes to Elizabeth's and creates Mondale. Those are my boys. So I did that, too. And it's been an interesting life. And uh, I've, been a, I've been a lot of places. I've met a lot of people. I've done a lot of things. I have done everything except be mayor of Savannah. And as the, um, that is the top of my bucket list. It's a short list. I want to do that. And I want to make the, the one movie that, of my favorite story. But um, there's nothing more important to me than Savannah. There's nothing that I love more. And uh, this is my time. It's my time. It's my time. We've heard this before. I remember Otis Johnson said, it's, 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 it's our time, he said. Meaning it was time for African Americans to take their place at the table of authority in Savannah, Georgia. Well, just as it's true of people, it's also true of the individual. And this is my time. It's my time to serve in this capacity. And it's a one-time offer. It's take it or leave it. It's now or never. I'm not coming back at 66 and try this again. <laughs>